Okay, so Claire, welcome to the Disenfranchised. How are you doing today? Yeah, good. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. I'm I'm looking forward to this conversation because it's it's the first time we've 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 spoken really, and um, I've been seeing you about quite a bit on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, see that you've been on TV and your, your mum's been getting various awards and things. So I think we've got quite a bit to talk about in this episode. But um, before we dive into some of that, um, like I do with everybody, it'd be great to find out what your first job was after education. Um, yeah, right. So I was thinking about this and the first job, kind of like I've done a bit of Saturday job things as well, because I thought that might be quite um, important um, in this. So I first started off in like, waitressing and bar work and really enjoyed the people um the atmosphere and the social um element to that and I finished my first job because I once dropped some cheese biscuits on the floor in the back kitchen and <laughs> the manager told me to pick them up and serve them so <laughs> wow really horrified. yeah so horrified I just remember walking out the back kitchen door and running home and thinking that's just not right so Customer service, I suppose, for me has always been big on my agenda and kind of like really high standards. Um, and then I went to university. I was always one to really kind of just get my way through education. I'd say I wasn't particularly academic. I was labelled the class clown and reports, things like that. Um, I didn't really, I don't know, I just didn't kind of fit um, with school as much as probably I should. And when I came out, um, of my A-levels, I managed to get into university and I went to study Spanish and media. And in my third year, um, in my mum's favourite saying, and I went to university to get a degree and I came out with a child. <laughs> but it was the best degree I ever got. Um, and it was massively life-changing in a very, very brilliant way. Um, I So I came out of university and I um, sadly suffered from um, postnatal depression and um, I was a single parent. Harry and his, his dad and I have always been, you know, great friends, but we weren't at a stage in our lives to stay together. And I then... Um, eventually went back to uni to finish my degree and I couldn't then quite find a job that fit in with not being particularly well and also um, bringing Harry up on my own. So I tried a couple of different things. I went to um, worked in retail at the Trafford Centre um, at a clothing shop there and then I um, that was quite a journey for me. It's about an hour in the morning, an hour in an yeah. evening, quite early starts and late finishes which was tough with having Harry um, and then I worked in a local estate Estate agent in Halifax. Um, again, very social. Really liked it. Um, but I didn't. A um, lot of weekend work, though, isn't it? In in both of those retail and estate agency is a lot of working on Saturday. So it must have yeah, been difficult with your with your son at the same time. You know, trying to find childcare and and and, and run around after them during the week as well. How, how did you cope with that? Yeah, it was just. I'm kind of like I'm 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 a hard worker, so I put everything into it. Um, and I got sort of three temporary contracts um, with the estate agent and I kind of wanted to get my teeth into it and wanting to go to the next stage and I remember coming home and my mum who's got her own business um, as her own ballet school business and um, she could see that I was really you know wanting to, to to make something really and to push forwards and she said well you know I've been thinking would you like to come and work for me at my ballet school and help me with kind of marketing that kind of thing and you know build up the numbers or whatever I think she was really giving me, you know, like a another option. Um, so I've not ever considered it really. I had obviously worked um, little, little bits and bats through the family business I was growing up, through helping at the, in the shop or helping in classes or at shows and things like that. But um, I'd never really thought of it as a full-time option. So I said yes. Um, and that was when I really probably got my first dose of self-employed, really, although I was working, you know, with and for my mum. Um, it was my first yeah experience of self-employment was was that as a as an employee like a PA way employee or did you have to set up your own limited company at that point you know uh, just I ran um, yeah it was working yeah with my mum really so she she set all that up and then I it was kind of she was yeah she was helping me out um but she did need someone to help. If she was going to grow the business, she needed someone to help her, her grow it and look after the, you know, a bit more customer service, I suppose, and oh, yeah. things like that. Um, and 
I remember distinctly in the Monday morning, the first day that I started, we were in the kitchen and the, she, it was about 10 past nine. I'm starting to get a little bit itchy thinking, because I've not been used to, you know, you have to start on time and you be there on time and you finish it on time. And, and I remember saying, I'll oh, just put the kettle on. And I'm thinking, oh, God, it's 10 past nine, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't we be doing some work? And I realised that kind of is one of the perks, not just putting the kettle on, but the fact that you're your own boss and you can manage your own day. I did realise then that she never actually had an end point to those days and <laughs> being self-employed <laughs> all, also means all-consuming um, and you have to manage um, the start and the stop time. So, yeah, that was my first experience of being... Um, it was because I think it was because my mum, it was more of a self, self-employed yeah. um, structure, I suppose. Yeah, that's interesting. So how long had her business been been going at that point? Was that well Gosh. established or were you helping to to, to, to build it from the ground no, up? She, she'd had a dance school at that point, probably about 50 years, 45, oh, 50 wow. years. And she ran student houses um, and rented student houses out. So I was helping in, you know, different parts of the business, really. Yeah, so yeah. somebody with a, a, a good amount of experience that you could tap into then. So... What, what what things did you feel like you you've learned from from your mum in those early days? And I expect there's more over the years, but in those early days, what what kind of things were you learning? So basically, my mum, my mum, it was my mum's business, and I was working within that business. And although I wasn't, my eye on it wasn't as an umbrella view of the business. I was working within it um, as an employee, really. Um, but when you are doing that, you're subconsciously picking things up and. I always think when I started Baby Ballet in 2005, because I'd worked with my mum since about 1996, I'd picked up little things um, that I probably wasn't aware of, but I still feel like when I started my business, I had very little idea of what I was doing. You know, it was because I'd been doing a job within that business. Yeah. Whereas it, I think it's when it's your own business, you have to take you very different approach you're wearing different hats you do you get what I mean so it's like I did yeah completely different mindset isn't it things, but yeah putting that into practice I suppose and I really you know had very little knowledge of how to run a business um when I first started but I probably picked up little bits that I hadn't realized um in that time frame of um well I think every job you do it makes an impression in some way doesn't it so going back to the cheese and biscuits I knew that that wasn't how now I, I knew that that wasn't how I'd want to run a business but at that point I didn't think that I wanted to run a business <laughs> <laughs> yeah no, it, it's, it's been interesting speaking to to people like yourself because um especially when you hear about their early career you can see how it's formed their future decisions as to what they do and how they do it and and you're right that that one small little moment uh, has actually shaped you in some way and I think what you're saying there is speak, you know, working with your mum was that, okay, you, you may not had gained all of the knowledge required to run the business, but you're familiar with certain aspects of it that then can help to shape how it should be done. Maybe because I think the difference between being an employee and and being a business owner is you have to make those decisions and therefore you need to have enough knowledge to be able to make those decisions when you're an employee you just do what someone else says, right? It's a lot easier yeah. to to do, to run accounts or bookkeeping when someone else tells you how to do it. But when it's your decision on how to do it, that's a that's a completely different thing, I think. And um, uh, yeah, I've I've been learning, you know, just setting up uh, your own limited company. I mean, that, that, is that the right thing to do or not? Should it be VAT registered or not? These little things feel like big yeah. decisions at that point in time, don't they? But I don't think you ever you ever really get to the end of that learning curve if you if you want to keep um keep growing your business because there's always another challenge that faces you and you know it's like you can never know everything you've got to always be you know like asking questions and listening and and getting advice from other people because you know going back to what you know hindsight's a wonderful thing if I'd have had the knowledge when I first started of certain things you know I might have done it a little bit differently or you know, like I'm learning now about how to um, move the characters that we've got into sort of animation to be a bigger children's brand. And, you know, that I don't know the answers to that. I've got to learn it. So, you know, I might have learned things about franchising, about being self-employed and how the business is set up. But I'm now starting a new journey and it excites me. So it's kind of like if you're at that beginning of your, your, your journey in business, 
see it as a, a learning curve, not as a, a kind of an obstacle. Um, it be something that's going to get in your way of, of moving forward because everybody's been at that stage and you can't know everything um so kind of everyone needs to yeah if they're starting up the business i said to new franchisees you know just be kind to yourself it's you know you can't expect to know what one of our franchisees who's been running for 13 14 years knows enjoy the process not just not just about getting to the end of the road because when when you get to the end of the road you'll want to go somewhere else somewhere else if you're an ambitious um driven person yeah, I like that, and I, I think that's um, that's something I think about entrepreneurs in general. Is they're not oh, they're they're proactive people, right? In general, you know, as a as a, a label, I guess, but mm-hmm. also the curious and, and ready to learn and, and make mistakes and learn from those. I think those are some of the key traits. It's not like uh, I, I probably used to think of it as. Uh, you know, they're just always trying to sell something to somebody, but <laughs> uh, which oh, yeah. maybe maybe they are but it's not it's not what it's all about is it actually there's other things that drive them and if if you're somebody who enjoys learning new things and taking on new challenges that's that's it's probably the right way to go is be self-employed but you, you started to talk about baby ballet and I want to kind of um go into that in a moment before I but before I do I just wanted to find out from you then your your mum obviously had um uh, played quite a big part in your your, your kind of early days in your career and probably from the sounds of things was quite influential in your decision to start uh, Baby Ballet. So um, can you tell me a little bit more about her? I mean, I know recently she's had a few TV appearances and things. So <laughs> yeah, tell us a little, share us a little, uh, a, li- a little bit about your, your mum and how she's no, impacted we, your life. Yeah, we do have to curtsy now when she walks in the room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's, um, in fact, interestingly, when you said that about baby ballet, she didn't believe in baby ballet when I first started. Oh, wow. Nope. She completely poo-pooed it. She said it wouldn't work because she just thought that teachers and, um, you know, like um, they would dance teachers, ballet teachers would just do their own thing as, she, as she'd always done. But my vision was so much bigger um, and so much bigger around the ethos and the values that we um, we bring to all the teacher, to children that we teach. Um, and she just did not believe in it at all. So she had her own business. She'd got three children. Um, and I've grown up into a world of ballet. I was born into a world of ballet. So my mum's school and outlook has always been very um, family friendly school, you know, very about each and every single child. And that's definitely where I get my ethos from. Um, but I think I've taken it to a different level in like really making sure that children's confidence um is an individual thing is each child is different each child is unique and we need to make sure that we're nurturing them in their each and individual way um and I've put more focus on that my mum has always done that but I've kind of gone to that different deeper level with that um so she has always danced um she's always had a ballet school since I was born and I was very negatively impacted by the ballet world and the ballet industry as a whole. So it's important to stress that it wasn't my mum's school and my mum's ethos that made me feel like this, but the ballet industry, because my mum was connected to ballet in a very more kind of like a higher way. She examined all over the world for children's examinations for the Royal Academy of Dance. And we went to um, performances and I was seen like the best of the best in the ballet world and wrongly comparing myself to that so for me success had to be that you were super skinny success had to be that you were the best at you were always at front of the stage you were always the one that was chosen to to and it wasn't real at all but in my mindset and my head I'd built up this unrealistic um ideology of what I should be like and I left ballet at 14 feeling chubby feeling rubbish feeling all the negative things that came with it um now it that was my own mind allowing me to you know be influenced so badly and I think it's important to see what an influence external factors have on people um you know social media with young ones now and you know the impact that has but I came away really having a bad taste in my mouth about ballet um it was maybe a little bit too sensible for me at that time in my life as well, like quite strict, quite formal, quite 
and it yeah and so it kind of like it it, it did leave me with a bit of taste but normally you leave a help leave a hobby and you probably don't have much else to do with it again you know so you, but because it was in my life so um so predominantly it didn't go away so I tried to distance myself from it probably subconsciously but I still went and helped with shows I still went and helped you know in the dance shop um still went to these competitions and things um so yeah so it kind of like had a negative effect but I was going to um, say it probably an additional pressure is the fact that your mum was so so into that world as well you know um not intentionally but that that puts pressure on you in some ways to be the the the, the perfect child that is yeah, with this never, great teacher you know in, in many ways that, yeah and I never had that, you know, my mum, like she never, no. I, I never remember once saying you are going to ballet or you must do this or you follow, you know, this dream because of me. Never, never, ever, ever. So you none you of put it on yourself though, right? Like, yeah. yeah. I, I did. And looking back, I put it on heavily, like really heavily. So, you know, I've, I've struggled for a long time with, you know, body confidence and self-esteem and imposter syndrome, all those things. Um, and, you know, it's it, that that world didn't leave me, which I'm really grateful for now, and I can see all the positives of it, and it's helped me create a business where I bring um, kind of a very we're very focused on um, self belief, and although these children are very tiny, we do six months to six years. It's all about sort of like you know giving them confidence, letting them be an individual, giving them a lovely introduction to the world of ballet and dance. But if that goes on, that they, they join for, you know, two, three years or they go on to have a career in it, those foundations have been fun and they've been filled with joy. And uh, that's really my mission, sort of based on the things that I found were my challenges to make sure that I do my bit to, to make ballet the most fun word it could ever be in a person's life. Yeah, that's great. So how, how did you, you actually start Baby Ballet then? Um... You know, you, you was at the dance school with your mum. So how did you go from yeah. there to, to starting this this business? So I um, yeah, I was working um, in my mum's school and she was looking after Harry one day when I was working and she came home and I'll never forget. She said, I took Harry to um, a play gym on the way home. Do you remember when play pubs, play gyms became the thing where parents could go and have a, have a drink and the children could play in the, 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 the soft play yeah. um, and ha- happy days? And so she came home she said oh, I found this really brilliant venue for a preschool class and my immediate thought was oh my god this woman just never ever stops working <laughs> 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 and, and I was like right okay so I'll try and find some time at some point to go up and you know speak to them she went no don't worry I've booked you a meeting tomorrow morning with the manager <laughs> um and I went up and and it was just from there we set up the classes within, within you know two or three weeks and um, it was the beginning. It was the beginning. So, you know, she found that venue and it was for me that setting in itself created that sense of community that was just so beautiful and so wonderful for parents and carers of preschool children to come and have a place where they could do something active and fun with their child, but also have a social environment themselves because it it, rather than just going to the ballet school and dropping them off or you know sitting and doing a little class they have that social element as well and that's a big part of the growth of baby ballet the fact that these relationships and friendships were blossoming from from these first classes um and I just think the the very um very friendly atmosphere very just very fun and I remember parents coming in and sharing stories of their ballet experiences like oh this is so magical it's so lovely because I wasn't allowed to go to ballet because I was too fat or because I was, you know, my mum thought I was a fairy elephant or the teacher was too scary. So I left. And like, what are these horror stories about ballet? It's beautiful. So that was where maybe those conversations and my, um, my, the fire in my belly and these ideas of like wanting to create this, you know, like wonderful world that that's where it all began. And some parents had kind of like, you know, like more, anxiety issues or you know new baby it's very it's it's a new thing having a child you know so there were this sharing and caring community that we were developing um was really special and that was about 19 about 1999 with those first classes yeah wow and and th- th- those first classes you you say your mum came home and, and and told you about the venue had you at that point decided you were going to to start something like this and and what made you yeah. decide to no oh okay no, so she just no. said okay 
Yeah, so she she found the venue and said it'd be a great place for a preschool class. So then we started the venue, two classes on a Thursday morning. The, my mum's main teacher was teaching these classes and they were just so positive. And I just remember this vibe of like just pure joy and really kind, caring environment. Yeah. The children were blossoming. The parents and carers were loving it. My mum's school was then getting all these children feeding into it that were coming from the preschool classes at the at the play gym. Um, then, you know, naturally, so that was kind of like the form of, I suppose, marketing, and it was just, they were just coming through. Um, and, yeah, so then after maybe two, three years, we went and started some more on a Monday, so two more classes, because they were so busy and there was so much demand for them. I was driven by this feeling and this passion and looking at, you know, these children learning and thinking, gosh, you can get so much... So there's so much more to a preschool dance or ballet class than just the actual technical side of teaching that skill, the social, the physical, the emotional, all the friendships that were the, that were being created. It was just, yeah, it was just wonderful. So it was my, then that was when I started to get these ideas of like, I want this feeling to get out there. I want more children yeah. to enjoy this. I want more parents and carers to enjoy this. Um, and then, really yeah so that was where the uh, the idea germinated and um, it gives you your big why doesn't it to, to get that feeling out there um, yeah that is my why for the business yeah to, to just drive those positive um experiences and enhance the child's development in as many ways as we possibly can and, and you, you talked about the confidence piece for, for the children. I think that's really important at that age, even more so than the activity that they're doing in many ways. Um, so I guess the first question is how how were these, was it down to the, the fact that the parents could join in? What would you put down to the, the, the main factor that's kind of the differentiator for the kids really in, in helping them to build that confidence? Just really probably based on, what I wanted to achieve with it, which was probably subconscious at the time, I knew it was all about each and every child being an individual. So, you know, like I was massively focusing on, you know, that all children are different, all people are different. They've got different, you know, different strength, different stamina, different agility, different flexibility, different everything. You know, everyone is unique on this planet. And for me, they're not just a group of children in, you know, in, in, coming in and teaching them and you say you know right okay so we'll do you know bend and stretch or demi plies or whatever it, it might be it was about all those individual children growing and learning and being nurtured and in in their because of their own individuality rather than it being just a group and teaching a group I wanted each one to have self-belief and it, it was just yeah kind of I suppose that individual had, and the atmosphere because the parents and carers are all there I'm a big believer that um it's having having the, the parents there because of the it was literally a conservatory that we cleared the tables and chairs out of <laughs> so the, the parents and carers sat around the, the side and the children were in the middle and I think that sometimes frightens teachers because the parents and carers can sometimes be a little bit of a distraction to the children but it was just this formula that was so positive and it was so engaging and so interactive and we were in, in, involving the parents and carers in it rather than don't run to mummy or don't run to daddy or grandma you know it was just so relaxed and friendly I think that was one of the um one of the the, the loveliest parts for me the atmosphere and the and the, the yeah it's good it's just ran yeah it, it, it is the opposite of what people generally tend to think of when they think of ballet I think or what I used to anyway and that was um uh, you know probably a school in Russia somewhere where I, I don't know all the terminology but somebody's got their leg very high up in the air and um have to be on their tiptoes and you know it's all quite strict with someone shouting at them so yeah what you're describing there yeah, ballet, is yeah, completely ballet, opposite ballet, ballet is is has got so many there's so many benefits to a ballet class i think that's the perception of it and that's you know what i'd grown up looking at the the best of the best and you know it's like there's so many other skills that can come that you learn with it of being part of a class being you know friendships and yeah. all those different things that come with it so yeah it was kind of making it a a very accessible place to to learn and have a lot of fun Excellent. So how, how did the business grow from there then? Um, I believe it's in Halifax you started, is that right? Yeah, that's right. In Halifax, that's my hometown. And I had the four classes. So 
got married in 2005 and when I got back from Australia from getting married my mum said right I know you've got this idea for baby ballet didn't really get it um but if you want those four classes I'll give you those four classes and you can start you know start on your own type thing so I'd done from the nap from 99 to 2005 I'd done lots and lots of thinking lots of lots of probably thinking I want to I I want to make this feeling, I want to get it out there. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know what to do, but I was just so driven, like I said before, about that, you know, the ethos and feeling that was that was um, the biggest part of it. So I thought, right, you know, it's time to take the leap. Um, asked my husband, um, you know, I know we've just got married, but would you mind if I, <laughs> I left my stable job? And my mum said she'll give me these four classes. And he's, you know, always been ultra supportive. Um, and he said, yeah, that's fine. I was like, right, okay, so we're going to need to remortgage the house. I need to buy a big fluffy teddy bear. I need to buy a pink car. <laughs> I think he was like, oh, my God, what is going on here? Um, but I just believed in it so much. And I think with what you're doing with these podcasts about people, you know, taking that leap of faith to start your own business, is there ever a right time? Probably not. You know, you can line everything up and get everything in order. And I've done so much research, but... I could have done more and more and more and more for a long time. And I just remember thinking, right, I believe in it. And I've done enough of the research, the probably not so much on the pros and cons of the business, because I couldn't really see anything else out there that I was doing, um, which gave me a lot of confidence, actually, of like, no, it's it, yeah. it was actually I was quite fueled by that because I was like, there, there is no ballet franchise why is there no ballet franchise? There's got to be one. There's got to be one that's doing this so that people can enjoy these kind of classes um, anywhere and everywhere. And because I couldn't find one, that made me even more driven to go, right, not sure what to do, but I'm going to go for it. And taking that leap of faith after we'd got married was um, hard, but I truly believed in it. Um, so I went for, went for it and then started to hire another venue, you know, a little bit down the road um in brick house in huddersfield in halifax town center and every class that i did um promoting it with a little kind of poster that i'd done put together on my computer with a <laughs> you know logo that i'd created myself um they were just so full and they were busy the demand was there and people were really enjoying what we were doing so that gave again gave me that drive to move to the next stage so when when you set out in being self-employed you, you, you mentioned earlier you had a, a young child so how, how did that fit around that kind of relationship you know um we talked earlier about you know having part-time jobs and weekend jobs and, and, and things like this so how did that how did that work for you when you were self-employed how did you manage to, to balance the two so when I first decided to take the plunge I had Harry who was um who was then um nine and I also had Cyrus, who was born in 2003. So in that thinking time between the setting up the classes in 99 to launching um, my own business in the 2005. Um, so then I also had in the next um, three years, I had two more girls. So I had um, Claudia in 2006 and Kitty in 2008. And for me, um, my family absolutely comes first. So and um, the children are my everything and you know the family unit here is more important to me than anything to do with the business but obviously the business was growing at the same time and I had to juggle I had more balls in the air than I could ever have imagined um but I suppose the beauty of self-employment it didn't mean that I worked less it didn't mean that I worked um, any less hard anything like that it was full on but it meant that I could do those school runs if I wanted to and when I wanted to I could go to all those assemblies I could do all the um sports days and for me that was one of the benefits right from the be beginning about being self-employed so I suppose it can be seen as a quite a challenge I think when people have got a family and they think gosh I want to set my own business but um what about the family? What about, you know, the the, the, the income, the, the responsibilities? And But for me, that was like, you know, the the business works around me and my family, not the other way around. And it, it's been hard. You know, there's been times when it's been incredibly stressful, incredibly busy. Um, but I suppose I can look back and think I didn't miss anything um, to do with the you know, their kind of school parents' evenings or I could choose when, you know, when I worked and when I didn't work. 
and that didn't mean that I, you know, was absolutely in control because there were times with having four children and business running and a team of people and a franchise network growing that things were definitely out of control. But from a, a mum's point of view, um, my children are my number one. So I suppose that being self-employed gave me those benefits um, to choose. And so one of the the benefits of franchising, especially I suppose in the industry I'm in, in children's activities, um, lots of people want to become um, self-employed, but worry about the family, you know, how will that impact yeah. on my family? So it's being co- con- conscious, I suppose, that the balance is, is achievable, um, but you have to, um, I suppose, that there's ups and downs in everything, isn't there? But for me, it's the benefits that self-employed brings, um, being a franchisor, um is my own business and franchisees have their own business associated and attached to our brand and they get that benefit of being able to choose when they work they work you know they work um not necessarily just daytime hours when the children at school some of these businesses they've got a really big now with over a thousand children attending a week so they've got to manage that well but they do have that um I suppose it's, I see it as a, you know, like a, a benefit of being self-employed that if you want to to do those school runs and that's your choice, you should be able to build your day around um, your family. Yeah, I think it's great because then your your franchisees are are learning from your experience and um, yeah, you're allowing them to have that flexibility because you've you found that model, you've built that model that they can then then follow, which I think is really yeah. really awesome. One of our franchisees, um, when she came up to, I think she'd been with us about eight years and she was ready to sell. So she was, um, she wanted to sell the business. And so I was like, well, you know, what, what, what reason is it? What, you know, have we done anything wrong? Is there, you know, is everything okay? She's like, I've absolutely loved being a franchisee and it's fit perfectly around my children being at pre at primary school. Um, it's allowed me to do all those things with them that I wouldn't have got chance to do if I'd still been working the corporate world. But now that they're at high school, I want to go and I want to jump back into that cor- more corporate world. And for me, that was such a big thing to hear that our franchise had allowed that lifestyle. And lots of our franchisees, you know, they, they buy it for that reason. They want to have, they want to be a mum. They want to, you know, have a family and um, have control of, um, of what they do. Um, with their children so yeah it was a really big a big thing you know when something really sticks in your mind I'll never forget that because you know as a franchise or you want to please you want everyone to be happy and it's like oh really it was one of the first ones I think as well to sell which is is quite a hard a hard thing because you kind of think oh is everything all right but yeah she said no it's done absolutely everything I wanted it to do it's just now it's time for me and the next part of the journey and that that big reason she was wanting the franchise was to fit around her children that's awesome so that's that's a big difference from you at uh, an early age being fairly uncomfortable you said body conscious and and you know un- uncertain about who you were and what you wanted to do in the world to to now you're fully confident this is what you're going to do and like you say it's a risk right to to go and be self-employed so to to be that determined what what do you think kind of led to that what 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 brought you to that position was it just being in those classes and experiencing that that positivity yeah that vision and wanting to make a difference, wanting to bring that vibe and that that positivity and that energy um, to more people. That was, yeah, and that was my driving force. And then really to do everything I ca- could to empower um, empower children. I'm not, empowering children sounds like, you know, like <laughs> giving them the best start, I suppose, and giving them confidence and giving them all these skills um, and, you know, the social environment and... Um, and seeing as well how much of an impact the class has had on all those different areas of learning, um, you know, and those skills, like you saying before, it's not just the activity itself, it's all those things that go around it. And, you know, there's a wealth of things for, for parents and carers to choose from now. And they bring so much more, those activities bring so much more than just the actual, you know, skills of that sport or hobby that, that you go into. So, yeah, so, so um, where, where's baby ballet at today then so starting off with those four classes um yeah so we've got now we've got 86 franchises in the uk we've got 23 licenses over in australia so it's a it's a license model over there not a franchise model and we've got a master licensee in new zealand we're just about to sign the master licensee for australia and we've got baby ballet in singapore and 
soon we are to um well we're exploring at the minute very um kind of like but someone very interested in dubai and also someone in america so we're expanding the trademark portfolio so that we can get it um yeah as global as we can we've also developed a range of parties merchandise uniform um we've written three stage shows we've written our first book and we're looking now into kind of developing the characters we've got a range of children's characters who really bring those brand values to life and um, children can relate so well to children's characters so those have grown over the years um and bringing those into kind of like more um animation and content for for digital as well as the teaching element of that so we did a lot online when we were in lockdown um which we yeah were- I, was, I was going to ask you about that about how how did covid impact the the business because uh, i know my own children you know is trying to get them to dance in front of the tv screen and that they were they weren't too happy about it um but uh, yeah how, how did that impact you you in your network we we really we put we went straight online so that we could keep our customers um you know keep the keep the classes um coming to them it was quite a difficult age group I was sort of like you know six months to six years six years is quite it's quite tricky so we added lots of different content so we brought the characters to life more with storytelling with um more characters songs and dances and um boogie times that kind of thing so we could really bring the brand into people's homes to keep that um enjoyment and fun factor up and keep them moving and keep them keep them learning but it was quite tough so then you know each sort of every half term and term that the lockdown continued um our franchisees were simply phenomenal at being resilient and the the way they handled the pandemic was just I can't I can't begin to tell you how incredible they all were how they all stuck together but they were just so caring about their customers and wanted to deliver as much to them as they could so we tried um well we we tried for the whole time during the pandemic but the numbers did slightly dwindle because of the engagement like you're saying with your children it's very difficult to um to to bring that same face-to-face um experience to life through the screen so we did the very best we could and in some ways that's helped us now to springboard um further forwards in in areas of the business that may have taken two or three years more time to develop so but yeah it was, it was a tough time but the franchise network were oh, incredible <laughs> it's, it's interesting what you're saying there about the, the the customer service piece you know it goes back to the the, the cheese cracker being dropped <laughs> on the fraud floor doesn't it you know it's still coming yeah still coming through as it's it's not acceptable to do that and you, you've got to do the best by your customers which are obviously the the children and their, their parents but um I, I guess during lockdown you said some of these other services you developed you're then allowing yourself a bit of um uh, time to look at them right when 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 you're really busy and expanding and growing and delivering the the I guess it's a service right that you're providing but whenever you're delivering something you don't have time to kind of analyze the business and look at other areas so I guess COVID's given you time to to do that and um, you said that was through merchandise and things like this which it's quite interesting because it's not something I'd really thought about personally with um, you know the any kids activities clubs and I, I know they a lot of them you have to buy the kit or you can buy the kit and things like this. But um, you've got, yeah, quite a few different, I had a look on the website and there's quite a few different elements that you've got that you're offering now, which I think is really interesting for anyone maybe looking to buy into your franchises. Okay, yeah, it is a, uh, a, a ballet class, but also there's there's more to it. There's more avenues that you can re- rely on, even if there there is a difficult time for some reason. So I think that's that's really um commendable and I, f- I think you should be massively proud you know thinking of being in that conservatory from from those really early days now to being well you, you it seems like you went straight to the other side of the world <laughs> you know it didn't hop to france and then to dubai and then over to australia just went straight to the other side of the world so uh i, I think you can be really proud of that um but yeah what why did you do that why did you go to the other side of the world straight away australia it was someone who approached me so someone i was introduced oh, wow. to who was there who could see a big gap in the market over there for for what we were doing and it was uh, yeah it couldn't have been further could it um, <laughs> for us to, to export and but again I suppose like the leap of faith and you know he 
massively believed in what we were doing. Um, I knew that he was very well connected and very, um, very experienced in what he did with dance studio owners over there. Um, the license model was um, a, a, an easier way, I suppose, to roll out over there because um, we were just selling the program, the syllabus that we've developed, all the training DVDs into the dance studios so that those dance studios over there, they just plug and play us as the preschool model. Whereas over here, it's a full business. It's, you know, it's a much okay. bigger, um, a, a bigger thing. And so it was, you know, less systems, less operations, that kind of thing. So um, he... Um, we set up in partnership but very soon after we set up he actually um, got the opportunity to his dream was to move to america um so we're talking a few weeks so this business was set up and he was like oh i've got this you know my big dream and i'm always one for everyone you follow your dream you know you've got to do what you want to do in life um so it was a challenge it was hard because then i became obviously the single owner the sole owner of the business over there and running that from over here has been you know been quite hard at a fantastic customer service lady that was involved but then just before the pandemic she moved on to a different um a different post so we've been running it from um from here through the pandemic and now we're just it's great now that we're getting a master license um on board so that someone on the ground really growing and developing it over there um sort of under our under our training and support yeah, that's great. So it, it, in the UK then, what kind of um, support team is there available for, for anybody who is maybe thinking of joining your network? For our franchisees, um, yeah. we've got a, a superb head office team. We had to make redundancies, unfortunately, during COVID, which was my biggest heartache out of the whole, everything that went through the pandemic. I've learned so much from the pandemic and I've taken all the positives out of it. But the hardest thing for me was lo- losing key staff that had been with me from the beginning. Yeah. Um, so we've tightened up on systems and processes so that franchisees have got um, a super t- t- um, tight support. And um, we have myself, I've got the our financial director, Chantel. We've got Lucy, who's now been made managing director. We've got Harry in sales and we've he, Harry does a lot of the, the franchise support. And we also have... Um, Catherine Bookkin, I'm giving you all the names of my team here. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I literally adore them so much and they're brilliant. Um, and then we have um, Louise in merchandise and retail. So we've, we've uh, they are we're like, we're all key to the franchise network here. So we we have a really, um, a really strong support system in place in that we do monthly Zoom meetings. We do regional meetings. We've got six monthly focus groups. So we do shorter, sorry, smaller groups of franchisees coming together so that they can it's the peer-to-peer peer as well as us sharing um sharing what we do at head office and um letting them know what's going on from 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 this side and then we have the annual conference which we've been really sad to miss for two years so we're hoping yeah. to have a, a face-to-face in may if we can make that happen but there's lots of people um you know, franchise franchisors who of having to still you know pull these conferences sadly because of you know the the fear still surrounding um covid and the you know uncertainty for people so you never know it might be it might be online but um it will be lovely to get a back face to face but the, the the community of franchisees are just so incredibly supportive of each other and it doesn't matter whether someone's been here a week or whether someone's been here for 14 years everyone's valued and everyone can bring something to the to the baby ballet family as we call it Great stuff. Great. Now, I, I normally have uh, three questions to kind of wrap up the, the podcast. But before I do, I noticed that, um, you, I mean, on your YouTube channel, nearly 4 million views. That's that's pretty impressive. Um, and you've also been on T, you know, you've had the, the brand on TV and things that I just wondered, um, I, I, yeah, how, how does that help? The, 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 how has that helped the business being so visible and, and, and out there? I, I, over the years, have you seen it really having a, a big impact on on um, the number of classes you're able to open up off the back of that? And and, and what? T- yeah, tell me about some of them. I'd I'd like to know what it's like to be on 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 TV with uh, we've I've written it down because I'm not <laughs> I don't watch Strictly and things like this. But Wayne Sleep, you've you've seen so or you've been on TV with so yeah. So I'm quite. I mean, not many people perception versus reality. I get quite nervous in front of the camera and it's not something that I really 
massively and not saying I don't enjoy it but I find it I get really really nervous my mum on the other hand is fantastic at it and she it's really natural to her um so it's lovely actually that she enjoys that part of it because I can take a little step backwards um especially <laughs> recently she's been featured on Strictly on um on Strictly Take Two which was a beautiful piece um that was put together about her career and her you know joy of dance and, and, and sharing dance um with 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 people um so she's great at that and she's also just been on the New Year's Honours list which is a, just a an absolute you know what an achievement that is and yeah. um it does you know obviously the the PR side of that is is great for me the biggest thing that I've done and gone out of my comfort zone with, was with the big ballet um, t- channel four series, which really was to um, push the boundaries and to challenge the, um, the, the perceptions that you have to be thin to do ballet. And it was to take a group of um, different sized dancers and then put together um, a short version of, of, Wayne, of, of Swan Lake with Wayne Sleep and Monica Lockman um, as the mentors. Now, one of our franchisees, um, was um, was down in the studio one day and she went oh I've seen this um, I've seen this advert they're wanting dancers for this new series called this uh, it's called Big Ballet it's just perfect for you because it's everything you believe in and I think you should go for it and I was going absolutely no chance <laughs> you have got no chance <laughs> I cannot do that I cannot put myself forward for something like that anyway I read a little bit more about it after and I thought it actually does. It really, really is is absolutely all about why I started Baby Ballet, what I wanted to achieve. And it it kind of was then something I thought, I need to be brave here. I need to go for this because this might actually be something that helps me to really face those fears that I've got about, you know, dance and ballet and confidence and all those things. Anyway, so I found myself doing a little interview, put myself forward, never thought I'd get it. And I got chosen to be one of those on the, it was a three part series. Um, and it was absolutely life changing because for me, it allowed me to get back into the ballet studio. And Monica is incredible, but she was trained in Russia and she was super strict. Wayne was amazing. I mean, he's a legend in the dance world and he was incredible. But as an adult going into that environment then of like, I kind of quite enjoyed that that strict side of it that you know like the the, the, it was just like it's such incredible experience and it it let me put a lot of my demons to bed I think you know like actually performing on stage in a ballet um being brave enough to step because I never had the confidence um to do that so to do that was really really huge for me um I never liked dancing in front of my mum and she was in the audience so that was that was a big thing um I think it was just a big yeah, just a big tick box. And I know you asked um, you asked me about what is the most surreal experience you've had. Um, yeah, so that's that's my next question is what's the the strangest, weirdest, or yeah, funniest kind of stories from your career. So yeah, go go for it. It has to be <laughs> being in that being in that like that. Um, we were in in Leeds doing the filming. And it was the part of the audition. So it was the second audition. And I'd got down to first through the first day. I was in the second day. And they said, right, you've got to create your own minute, minute and a half of this is the music. This they've played as this um, excerpt from Swan Lake. You um you need to go away, have a little think about it, put a little dance together, and then you'll either perform in front of Wayne Sleep or Monica on your own in a room, and they'll be judging you. Um so I remember going into these toilets in this um stu- in this studio to think. I just can't do this. How can I put a dance together for myself? And I've got to either gonna I'm gonna be faced with Wayne Sleep or Monica Lockman. And like I just can't do it. I was ready for running fight or flight was telling me to go out of the door and just run a million miles <laughs> away. But I got something together and I walked in through the door and I'd got Wayne Sleep. So I mean Wayne Sleep's a massive, massive figure in the ballet world. And I remember going in and he just looked at me and he went, Well, you're not very fat. And <laughs> and and I was in size 12, but a size 12 is too big, too big for ballet. But he finished that. He finished that. The next sentence was, but you're too fat for ballet. And yeah. that is exactly what needs to change, in my opinion, because you don't have to be a certain size for ballet. OK, to be in the Royal Ballet or to get to that extreme, but all sizes should be allowed to put, do ballet. All 
abilities should be allowed to do ballet. So that was a really key moment, but incredibly surreal that I was then dancing to win sleep on my own. Just, yeah, I can't quite get my head around that. Um, but, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> but, think, yeah, I that, think it's, it's cool, though, that you've, um, you, you can see that, that, that kind of journey in your career that I, I guess um, baby ballet and ballet in general has allowed you to, to, to rebuild that confidence. But I think almost more importantly, that being self-employed has, has helped you to build up that confidence more and more as as people started to, re- you know, see your why and, and like like it that must be that must have given you a lot of confidence the point where yeah you're then doing this (laughs) ballet in front of Wayne's Leap that must have been uh we took Ben out because I'd met him then and we did the recording and everything and um I invited him to the franchise conference the year um that we'd done that um because you know the franchisees that we've got they've got such a performance background and he's a legend in you know the ballet industry so he came along and he was just so like I don't know, he was so complimentary about what we were doing. He loved the atmosphere. He taught them all a dance and it was great. And then we have Pink Beetles, so we've got Pink Baby Ballet Beetle cars and the, one of the franchisees had a soft top um, version in the car park and he just went and just jumped in over the top. It was a summer's day, so the top was down. He launched himself over the top and I've got this picture of Wayne Sleep like kind of like with his legs hanging out of this soft top. And it was, yeah, <laughs> just, just really, really surreal. Um, so, yeah, I think that was for me was probably the most random but yeah it was a oh, that's it cool was good, good one and um how about uh proudest or most inspiring moments in your career um the proudest is and the, probably the most inspiring is how our franchise network and how the franchise industry have all pulled together during the pandemic and during you know not having a clue what was what was coming what was around the corner and the way that That's everybody really, just pulled together um, and supported each that, other uh, um my franchisees had my it, back from day one it, and this is how i much, just my, my, literally jumped on I, zoom sort of as most franchisors i know I, um out there on, did and on a show called just said look i'm not sure what's going on but i'm not, not sure that. what's going to happen um, but I, uh, I am going to roll my sleeves right up that, and do everything I possibly um, can what, to get is, you and us and the brand through this. That, um, and I felt that uh, was I, also uh, that strength wife, from uh, the really industry as well was to, phenomenal. To um, uh, and and the the BFA, EWIF, the Children's Activities Association, which I'm passionate about. The industry supporting each other. I've made people who I knew in franchising have become friends in franchising. Yeah, that's um, awesome. it's really just and um, I'll take that, that you know the, like as being one of the very big benefits and pluses of the pandemic it was all about what can we do not what can't we do let's stick together together we're stronger um and it's really you know it's had a massive impact on me that um it was a tough tough gig trying to get everyone through and without any experience knowledge you know resources really for for that happening um I couldn't have made it through without, you know, my network being so incredibly supportive. Um, yeah. And I think trusting as well of, you know, let's make these decisions. We've got very little facts or stats to base these decisions on. Let's just do our best. Let's look after our customers and just keep that ethos. Yeah. And, you I, I know, our brand that, message um, close to our hearts. The, and the first one is to, to absolutely. Thankfully, the, the, we got two, through. Actually. Um, and the first one is to we're ready to thrive really, now. We've, we've um, took three new franchises on last week, about. which was great. Um, and um, awesome. to start the new to, year, to that, and franchises sure, year feel more connected than ever with um, everyone is, in that. Um, um, you know, as long as you follow all that wonderful the, industry that we're the, lucky to be the, part of. The, the, the protocols and the yeah, I, I think it's interesting that. Well, I think it's clear that. Yeah. you're you're really well really connected good, to your really your franchisees which i think is a um, really good trait to have just by just from the way that you speak about them and the way that you you care about them but i guess that's a form of customer service in itself right because they are in my view, um it, i guess in partnership with you but you're you're providing that, some form of service to them to help them to build their fully their business and then change their kind of to lives and futures um, and, and those of others and, as well uh, so um i, I think that's, no, that's, that's really good yeah, so i'm gonna it, um, i'll go for the last question you know, now which oh, is um just to, to follow those uh, obviously we, we talked a little bit about franchising but um if if there's anybody out there who's looking at buying a franchise um what one piece of advice would you give to them <laughs> mine would be to do all your research 
um, research the company, research the industry. Um, I always um, we I always um, ask our you know prospective franchisees go and find out what franchising is all about, as well as how we sit um, as a franchise. Research the company that you're interested in. But also, have a real good think about what it is you want to achieve do you want the challenges that come with being self-employed as well as the rewards try and understand what self-employed means um from a, a lifestyle point of view i suppose not just seeing all the positives that come with me because there's you know the well, challenges so, there really are challenges it, along um, the way and I look forward um, to listening to future but podcasts. i suppose once you've done all that research like we were chatting about earlier Thanks, you can research and research and research till the cows come home or you can you know keep thinking i'll oh, just do that bit at some point you've got to take that leap, leap of faith so if it's right in your gut and you've kind of analysed whether you think it's the right thing for you, I'd just say get to that point and just go for it. Go for it if it's right. <laughs> Excellent. You can never, you know, you never know really what's around the corner, do you? I mean, none of us were set for the pandemic. It came and we've, you know, you just got to do your best and always have high standards for yourself and for the franchise that you're going to become part of. Awesome. Claire, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for sharing your story and your your insights into your business and your life. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. No problem. Take care. Bye.